English and French are Cameroon's two official languages. The constitution of the country in Article 1, Subsection 3 uh, further highlights that both languages have the same status and the state shall guarantee the promotion of bilingualism throughout the country. It shall endeavor to protect and promote national languages as well. However, there exists an imbalance in the use of the two official languages in Cameroon despite the creation of a law on bilingualism, a commission to enforce its implementation and a rich human resource in the language service industry. In this edition of the program, we shall explore the role of translators and interpreters in the strengthening of the country's uh, language policy and what they can do to resolve prevailing challenges in a world of full of crisis. This is Hard Talk. <music> Our guest is a professional translator and interpreter with 11 years of experience serving international organizations. He worked at the Cameroon National Assembly before moving to the United Nations Criminal Tribunal uh, for Rwanda in Arusha in Tanzania. He is now at the African Development Bank uh, as consulting interpreter in the corporate language services, uh, serving meetings, conferences, workshops, as well as seminars. He is President Emeritus of the Association of Professional Translators and Interpreters in Cameroon and Africa's focal point of the private market sector of the International Association of Interpreters, of conference interpreters based in Geneva, uh, Switzerland. As a consummate wordsmith, he writes for the African region of the International Association of Conference Interpreters, as well as a founding president of the Arusha Toast Master Club. He is a motivational speaker, football, as well as music lover. Mr. Atsa Atogo, welcome to Hard Talk. Thank you very much. It's a big pleasure having you. The pleasure is shared. Eleven might huge years in the uh, translation and interpreters uh, business uh, how did you get in <laughs> the first time i interpreted was you know the primary school by the lake <laughs> we came from young from boya in 1972 after reunification and i was a scout under mr tanker mr fison and other boys were coming in from the southwest and the northwest and they needed to be helped to understand English and French. And so since I had picked up English and French with the kids around, I had to interpret for them. But I didn't know that this was a profession. Uh, and um, so I started interpreting from primary school. Quite a long journey. Um, <laughs> I've been in the profession now for 30 years. In 2006 or, or seven, I celebrated 20 years serving the National Assembly. It was thanksgiving to God for enabling me to go through school, picking up a job, and serving my country as translator, interpreter, IPU secretary, speechwriter for Right Honorable Speaker Kavai, for interparliamentary union conferences and the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association. And so I was like, I thank God that I've come this far, so I had a party to thank God for that and to tell friends, colleagues, and others that God had blessed me. So it's been 30 years since I've been in this profession, and I think it's a prestigious and wonderful profession, and I think that knowledge shared is knowledge multiplied. So I do motivational speaking, I talk in schools, I try to help young people to get into the right orientation for the right career. If you have academic excellence, you have professional exuberance, then your competency makes a difference. And then life makes life. Yeah. Okay, um, you have spent uh, almost uh, 30 years in this uh, business. What was the motivational um, factor that pushed you to become a translator and um, an interpreter as well? I went to CPC Bali. Unfortunately, Bali is besieged now. When I hear of the killings in Naka, I know that bridge. I went to school in Bali for five years. When I think that young people are being wasted and thrown in that river in Bali, which I know very well, my memories of Bali are 
jaded and they are bleak. But that's, that's another topic. I went to CPC Bali because it's a renowned school for the sciences. Zach von Jindam went to that school, Professor Zach Formum, Professor Mbafo, General Tato, Prime Minister Yang, uh, Prime Minister Achidi Achu. It's a great school. Known for its scientific um, excellence and prowess, I went there because I wanted to be a pilot. But um, we got the first mathematics test after we arrived in CPC Bali, and um, I think I was a bit loud-mouthed. <laughs> and uh, we were boasting that we came from Yaoundé. <laughs> and you had these boys from Bambalang, Babel C, Babel New, Those are Bambi. the Northwest. Yes. And they were feeling uncomfortable because we had come from Yaoundé. At the time, the Twin Otter was working, so I went to school by Twin Otter. The, that airport was working, Yaoundé airport was working. We had flights in this country. That first mathematics test, I had 25%. It was the worst mark in the class. And everybody told me, you'll be dismissed. <laughs> <laughs> and that was the rule. If you did not pass, you'll be dismissed. be dismissed. So I realized I was not made for the sciences. I was not cut out for that job. I could not be a pilot. I decided, what else can I be? The math, in the English tests, French tests, history tests, I had 80, 90, and above. And I knew that I was an art student. So I decided I would be an ambassador. Ambassador also flies. He's not a pilot, but ambassador flies from country to country. Sure. So yeah. it's not very far from piloting. From piloting as well. So I decided to be an ambassador. And I was going to go to Eric after first year in university. But while I was doing the bilingual series in the University of Yaoundé, I met a certain Martin Shungong. He is now the present Secretary General of the Interparliamentary Union in Geneva. That is the legislative, which is the equivalent of the executive run by Ban Ki Moon or Kofi Annan, yeah. or you know what I mean. <laughs> but he was an interpreter and he came to teach me translation and interpretation in the University of Yaoundé. The way he navigated from English to French, he shuttled both ways. He just caught your attention. I said, This is it. And he was such a nice man. He's my mentor. He told us, Egben Biwan, Asia Walters, Atsa Togo, you will be translators, you will do interpretation. And four years after, I found myself working in the same office as he was. So I had to move, and that's how I went to ASTI, and then I went to the National Assembly. All right, um, let's uh, get to the basics. The layman will want to know, every time people talk about translation, interpretation, are they the same, are they different? Uh, Where's the dividing line between translation and interpreting? You see, this is where we miss many things in Cameroon. Somebody was telling me people speak either French or English, and you find many ministers or government officials speaking difficult, with difficulty English or French because that is not their main language. Main language. Because they feel that if the, the audience is big, if there are more francophones here, I should speak French. If there are more Anglophones here, I should speak English. No. We have two official languages. Trudeau, the former Prime Minister of Canada, not his son, he said the imposition of bilingualism is not on the, in the citizen. It is on the state. state. It is the state to make sure that the country is bilingual and that the citizens enjoy the benefits of bilingualism through the services of translators and interpreters. So you speak the language you have to speak, and the interpreter is there, trained and paid to communicate to you the message that is being conveyed. So translation and interpretation are two different things, but many Cameroonians think that it is the same. And by the way, I think many Cam all Cameroonians think that they are translators and interpreters. Sure. But are they? That explains the horrendous and scandalous translation pieces you'd find on banners and billboards at the airport, you arrive and you find them and you're like, gosh, we should not have this. We are a blessed country. So the issue is translation is written from one language to the other to convey a message. Interpretation is oral. It is spoken from one language to the other. You make people who don't understand both languages or two languages to understand themselves. But while the one 
the medium is what is important here. While the one is written, the other is spoken. spoken. As simple as that. In a nutshell, that's the definition. All right. How important is this sector in an ever-changing um, um, global context where, uh, where it is being said that the world now is a global village? Uh, how important is translation and interpretation? In a global world, people interact, you know? There is commerce, there's trade. There's movement, there's transportation, there's interaction. If you can't communicate, how do you interact? How do you travel? How do you sell your goods? See, how do you make money? How do you carry out investments? Be they administratively to set up the framework for these services to take place, or be they in the corporate world? Even in entertainment, which is very uh, vibrant, yeah, vibrant, vibrant and booming today. So, in the world today, at the EU, you have, at the European Union, you have interpretation into 36 languages. Because all those countries, in their sovereignty, they have to make themselves heard, they have a right to make themselves heard, and they need to make themselves heard faithfully, accurately, in efficient and effective communication, and that can only be done in your, your first language. There are very few people who master many languages perfectly. So you speak in your language, and there's an expert, trained translator or interpreter to communicate whatever your message is into the other language to enable the others to understand and respond. So in the world of today, in the global village, you just have to have translators and interpreters. In Dubai, everything is in two languages. And that is why they can host as many people as they are hosting and their business is booming because nobody has a difficulty going there because they have services to make sure that whenever you go there you can communicate and you are comfortable. So it is indispensable. It's only going to grow. Translation and interpretation is only bound to grow if we want to respect all the conventions and treaties that we have signed about human rights and the right to uh, communicate in the language of your choice. Now, how important are these uh, treaties? Uh, we have the UN Declaration on the Rights of Persons Belonging to National Ethnic and Religious and Linguistic Minorities adopted in 1992, as well as the Universal Declaration of Linguistic Rights adopted in 1996. Um, how does this uh, foster the development, the growth of translation and interpreting in the world? It is for each country as we fit into the global village. We sign these conventions, we ratify them, we domesticate them, we include them in our national legislation, and we now see how to implement them. We have a number of these. Uh, Prime Minister Musonga was reminding ministers and secretaries general about laws that had been signed before, about making sure that English and French are used. And th th these are laws that President B has signed that we should make sure that these laws, decrees, community official gazettes should be published in both languages simply because there's a strong sense of belonging of acceptance of recognition and acknowledgement when you speak in your own your mother tongue when you speak in a language that you are comfortable in now you feel ostracized you feel marginalized you feel left aside when you cannot speak and cannot speak a language which is accepted and worse when you speak a language that is rejected Oh, no, me parle pa, faut parler anglais. Je comprends pas ça. Uh, what are you saying? Can you? It's very, 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 very embarrassing and very, very humiliating. So knowing that that sense of belonging is critical, that's why in Barcelona, those uh, conventions are ratified. It is for countries and nations to now implement them and see them live in various countries with the citizens being comfortable. All right, coming to Cameroon. Cameroon is the biggest exporter of translators and interpreters. Um, if you were to, as someone who has uh, gained a vast experience in this field, how can you quantify uh, the, uh, the exports of Cameroon's translators and interpreters? How huge is this resource? Uh, before I left Cameroon, I used to boast about Cameroonian translators and interpreters being the lions, the real lions of Cameroon. They win the mutual lions. Yes, because 
Are indomitable lions, I don't know that they are really indomitable. <laughs> we should learn how to choose their words. Because uh, indomitable, and then we come out... Because they are playing today. Second, uh, that's Japan. fine, that's fine. But we came out last or second to the last in Africa in 2010, right? 2010. Yes. Uh, in 2014, 14, I was at the World yeah. Cup. I was at the World Cup in Brazil. Almost the same score. No, we were fighting, instead of fighting the enemy, the adversary, two Cameroonian players, players exchange, exchanged blows. Those are the indomitable lions. No, the real indomitable lions, and who have been in the position of lions for a good amount of time, are the translators and interpreters of Cameroon. You can go and check. We fly the flag of this country very high. We are proud ambassadors of this country. Cameroon is the leading country churning and producing, churning out and producing the best translators and interpreters on this continent. But it is in Cameroon that we are most despised. Exactly, I will come to that very soon. So if you want to check, the last time I checked at the African Union, you have Cameroonian translators and interpreters, permanent staff and freelancers. They're doing a great job out there. You go to, um, at the ICTR where I worked, in a section of about 70 translators, interpreters, the majority were Cameroonians, Cameroonians. and the bosses were Cameroonians. The chief of language services section, Madame Dongo Keller, Justine, that's my mentor, she was the chief, and then Oscar Tanifum was the chief of interpreters. You had other top guys like Naosi, Wolase, Mbwayogo, Bong Bekondo, Roger, uh, name them. There we were highest in number, best in quality. If you go to the ICC as we speak, International Criminal Court. Court in at The Hague, Cameroonians are manning the show. We've exported them to Europe and as far as the extraordinary courts in the, in the chambers in Cambodia. You know how far that is? You don't hire someone at the court because the guy is good looking, it's because they are competent. They are competent. All right? You sit a test, an interview, a grueling test, which is international. Everybody applies and you sit the test. It's not because your father is, your, your mother is, it's not because you're in this political party or that political party or you're from this tribe or that other tribe. It doesn't work that way. These guys competed for these tests and they beat the others and they qualified and they're serving where they are serving. The same thing at the African Development Bank. So Cameroon is the leading country in translators and interpreters. We have strong competition from Senegal because they are more organized and they have quite some solidarity. I've seen Senegalese interpreters go with a blind Senegalese colleague and get him to sit down and show him where to press to speak, where to press to stop, just to make sure that this guy earns his living and that the Senegalese, they grow in their hegemony yeah, in the profession. You know? But until further notice, Cameroonians, we are what we are, we are where we are, the government needs to know that, and Cameroon needs to benefit from that. But why is Cameroon not benefiting from it? By the way, be, be, before talking about that, why are translators and interpreters not valorized despite the exploits on the international scene? Um, you need to ask those who are not valorizing or giving premium or pride of place to translators and interpreters. You need to ask government that question, not me. But I think that if the decrees, the laws are there, all you need is the political will to implement them. As I said the other day, why do you have lecturers, teachers from a corn or mal heading the translation units in many ministries? When you have professional translators and interpreters who are in those ministries and working under them, and working under them they have no clue about the mechanisms, the the reflexes, they don't know what is the diction, they don't know what is the register of a particular text, but they are the bosses. Why do we do that? Why do we do that? No, no, wh wh why do we do that? You want to take a butcher to start repairing shoes? Is he a shoe mender? Is it, is, is it rocket science? Is it so difficult? You will never take a lawyer to pilot a plane. Will you do that? Of course not. These are technical services. You tell me appointments are discretional, at the discretion of whoever is appointing. That is true. But these are technical positions. And it's a disgrace. It's a, an eyesore to see some of the translation that we have 
in this country today, especially as we want to enforce vivre ensemble. So everybody thinks that he must speak English or speak French. I was listening, watching CRTV the other day. Now you get a medical doctor to do a report on COVID in English. It is torture. Let him do the report in French or let her do the report in English and use the technical terms. This is a new domain, very technical. Why do you find <laughs> ministers and in the prime minister speaking French? You torture me, you make my life difficult when I have to interpret poor French into English. English. You torture yourself, you torture me, you torture the audience. What is our crime? What sin did I commit? Speak English. The interpreter is there. He will interpret it into perfect French. Speak French. I am there. I will interpret it into perfect English. Everybody is happy. But for some, I don't know whether it's a complex. I don't know whether it's a desire to prove a point. I don't know whether it's a desire to carry favor from the authorities or whoever. Maybe Don't you think that it's a pressure? Because many people are... Because the, the tendency is that the population expects the, these government officials to speak in both languages to, to indicate that they are bilingual. Is it not an aspect of a pressure? In the job description, is bilingualism one of the criteria? Is there, we don't even have job descriptions, do we? <laughs> so pressure from who? If you appointed me, you think I can do the job. Let me go do the job. The job has nothing to do with language per se. Okay? Let me do the job. And then you have the professionals, the practitioners, to communicate. So the pressure is not from the people. The pressure is from inside. At my age, I started taking pressure. I was taking pressure when I was stealing guavas and fruits from under pear trees or wherever. I cannot be taking pressure now. If I cannot do the job, I tell you, uh, Chief, I thank you very, very much. Um, I'm sorry if you expect me to become a linguist at age 60. I'm an engineer. I'm not a linguist. I'm not a I will not deliver my speech in French. I'll deliver it in English. I hear that there's a school that trains interpreters in Boya, and I hear that in your ministry there's a translation service. He will interpret it. Create employment by using professionals, for God's sake. Create a sense of fulfillment by using interpreters, for goodness sake. Make everybody happy by just some recognition or some acknowledgement. Abraham Lincoln says, every man likes to be acknowledged. When you go to ministries and you find the, translate, the office of a translator close to a garage or behind the, the lift, he barely has a table, he has no laptop. How do you expect him to work? A clear indication that the, that, um, the go government is not really making use of the human resource that are there. It is not. Unfortunately, and that is why many are seeking In international jobs. Yes, they are looking for greener pastures elsewhere. Or many also have settled to do freelance from their homes, and they are doing well. I salute all the young translators and interpreters who have been trained, who cannot find jobs here, but who, by internet, are working for other organizations um, online. You do your text, you send it, your account is credited. You do your text, you send it, your account is credited. You cover your conference, your account is credited. And you don't need to beg, you don't need to steal. You have some dignity. There's nothing like dignity. That is what we should keep. Now, for Cameroon to reap the benefits of uh, the translation and interpreters, what do you expect government to do as far as this sector is concerned? I'll give you a simple example. There was the trial of Sisi Kutabe and the nine. Ayuktabe, yeah. Ayuktabe. There was one interpreter for an entire court case. At the tribunal in Arusha, you had eight interpreters, 12 interpreters on one case. In Cameroon, we are behaving as if we can run a car on three wheels. And then we say, look, Cameroon, say, look, Cameroon. On that fair, come on. No, 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 no. <laughs> you will never play football 10 or 13 because, look, Cameroon, say, look, Cameroon. It's a very, very, very base, mean statement. 
But many people pride themselves in it. Okay? There are rules, there are conventions. And when we don't obey them, we may get away with it sometimes. And we have. But that is the, the African Nations Cup. Did we host it? We try to bend the rules and play games. And that is the humiliation that we got. Do you know how much, I have sp how much time I've spent explaining to people abroad? Why either in Addis Ababa or in Arusha or uh, in Canada. Or I go on a simple trip to go and earn my living quietly. And they say, oh, Cameroonian. Oh, yeah, Cameroonian. But what happened? How come? Now I start doing the work of the Minister of External Relations. I wish he knew that I'm helping to build the image of Cameroon. He'll maybe give me some foil coupons. <laughs> they will help me to run around in town. Peter, it will not be a bad idea, will it? <laughs> of course not. <laughs> there you go. And life, and life. And it will not kill him if he gives me some. But I'm just saying, we need to sit up. Let government use the professionals. That is for government. In those services, don't appoint language teachers, linguists to run translation services. They cannot do it. And give them the uh, affordable, the, uh, the, 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 right, yeah, the right tools. To yes. To work. Give them laptops. Give them the dictionaries. Give them internet connection, Wi-Fi connection. In many, only until recently, I don't know whether, I don't want to call names, but many of our offices and ministries, they don't have internet connection. They don't even have a website, Peter. You go to a little restaurant, a, roads, a, a, a restaurant in the back street of Nairobi. The moment you sit down and ask for a drink, you have Wi-Fi connection. Sometimes you go to a big hotel here in Cameroon, there's no connection. There's no connection. Why? Why do we do this to ourselves? So anyway, let's use the professionals. And then let us ask I said this yesterday, I think, if the Bilingualism Commission has as resource persons, ab initio, they sh there should have been translators and interpreters on that board. Okay? Yeah. That commission should be headed by, by a translator, translator, by a seasoned a translator, a consummate interpreter. Okay. Not necessarily. I have a lot of respect for Mr. Musonge. He can do it. But with the advice of seasoned translators and interpreters by him, does he have them? Does he have one? Okay, so ab initio, for me, all right, I respect the decision. It's already been taken. Now, one year, two years, three years down the road, can you harness the services of seasoned interpreters? Madam Justine Dongo Kele is a freelance interpreter. She's a senior. She knows what it is. Be it managing people or translating documents or interpreting speeches. She did the first speech of Akayesu. That is the guy, the prime minister who was indicted and sentenced for genocide in, uh, in, uh, Kigali. in Kigali, Rwanda. RF, RFI, CNN, the number of television stations that were listening to her voice as she interpreted that sentencing, that judgment delivery. It's amazing. People like Madame Campbell, She's in Boya, Mundra, Margaret Cabell. She was my director in the National Assembly. Isaac Musonge, Ngong Roland, um, Justine Dongo Kele, Joseph Fossab, Nausi Pierre, Wolase. These are guys who, sh these are people who taught me and who should be consulted about what is, how do we implement the policy? We've decided that this is what bilingualism should be. How do we bring this into effect? Effectively, how do we make it happen? You guys know what it is. You have many experts in that commission, experts in geography, experts in history, experts in sociology. Do you have an expert in translation, translation and interpretation? And interpretation? You have a football team where you have shoe menders, um, lawyers, medical doctors, um, a pilots. Uh, you have everybody in a football team except a footballer. They may be excellent. Excellent footballers, excellent pilots, excellent medical doctors, excellent pharmacists. In a football team, that team is going to fail. But you know, I think communities will have a lot of faith, so let us trust this commission, and um, by faith we will make it. Now, um, you were the pioneer president of the Association of Professional Translators and Interpreters of Cameroon. What is this organization all about, and um, what can you say about uh, its activities since its creation? Let me do a disclaimer immediately. 
there's a lot of usurping of powers or arrogating of titles in Cameroon. Anybody who has a PhD automatically becomes a professor. professor. I don't think that's how it works. And, um, and so you find many professors on TV panels. I see some people on TV panels virtually every week. It's a profession now. Eh? Interviews like this. You are a specialist in everything. You are a, speciality, you are a specialist in generalities. <laughs> Peter, honestly? No, no. I, I want to make it clear. I was not the first president of Aptic. You had another president before uh, Dr. Aroga, and I took over from Dr. Aroga. Aroga. So it was many years after. I was vice president before, and then I stepped down. Then I was elected president. Then I was re-elected. And the Association of Professional Translators and Interpreters in Cameroon um, is in charge of protecting and promoting the interests of translators and interpreters in the country, protecting the profession and protecting practitioners of the profession and ensuring that Cameroon indeed benefits from this bicultural heritage and which makes us unique in Africa. That's the association. Unfortunately, again, if we want to be serious, then the Bilingualism Commission would be talking with this yeah. association and use its services. I'm pleading and I'm asking, I was part of our General Assembly when we decided that we should write to the Musonga Commission, Commission and ask for an audience and offer a hand of fellowship to work with the Commission. We've written two letters. Until today, we've not received as much as an acknowledgement of receipts. You know how spiteful that is? You write to somebody who doesn't respond. You know how demeaning that is? You know how frustrating that is? Respond to me and tell me no. That is fine, but not to just say anything. It's an insult that is difficult to take. But we Maybe take it. the person in charge of delivering the letter has not done his job. Twice, we sent the first letter. We never got a response. I went there, I spent a day, I saw a mem four members of the commission. And I talked to the director of cabinet, and he asked me, please send that letter again. And I talked to Madame Lomgoy. Madame Lomgoy Leontine, she's our president, she works at the CRTV. I don't know how she's treated at CRTV. You need to check. It's unfortunate. But if you don't talk to them, how do you get the work done? So Aptic is neglected. And I was saying it is again. The Ministry of um, Public Service and Administrative, and Administrative Reforms. Reforms is recruiting translators and interpreters. They should harness the services of the association to endorse the work that they do. It is not human resources. It's not the DRG. He doesn't know what it is, who a translator and interpreter is, how to do, prepare a test and do the grading and do the recruitment of those people. Human resources is one thing, but the specialty of who these people are recruited, on every panel for recruitment, you have the recruit, recruiting director because he knows what he wants. The recruiting director is aptic. But at the, that ministry, I don't know whether they work with translators or interpreters. I hear there are some who have been involved, but not the association as such. Why are you dealing with individuals you've chosen entry to personae to work with when there is an association that could appoint and delegate recognized and authorized staff to represent them on that board depending on the qualities that they uphold? So when you don't work with us, we find ourselves on the back burner and our association is barely struggling. But abroad we are respected because we are one of the first that organize ourselves well. And within the International Association of Conference Interpreters, we have been called to give advice. I've given a talk a number of either in Spain or a number of times, or maybe in Colombia, on how to create a national association. In Cote d'Ivoire now, they are looking for a number of us, Atanga Livinus, Ayuk, we help them to put their own association in place because we've had one since 1991. So we are not being used. But if they don't use us, that is fine. We want to be used. You are our witness that we've offered our services. If you take them, fine. If you don't take them, there's nothing we can do. But history knows that we made an effort. And after that, there's nothing much we can do. 
Now, you spoke about the bilingualism and multiculturalism uh, commission um, making use of uh, APTIC. Now, in what uh, way can APTIC help or boost uh, the efficiency of this commission? The first thing we'll do the right diagnosis. The technicians who we are will be able to say, in this ministry, you don't have a translator as the head of the service, so you can't even supervise. So we recommend that in this ministry, the appointment of this translator or interpreter should be go this way or go that way. The, the people in charge of the, the people in the commission, they don't know who the translator or interpreter is. They don't know them. They don't, some of them don't know exactly what they're supposed to do. Because that is not their domain. They are specialists in other things. They are respected specialists in other domains. So we'll give them advice about how to work. We'll supervise the policy about how to work. We'll control the quality of the work that is done in the ministries. And then the quality of translation and interpretation will be better. Imagine somebody translates Ministry of Foreign Affairs as Ministère des Affaires um, Ministry of des Affaires Etrangères as Ministry of, Ministry of Strange Affairs. Is that a translation? No, it's very wrong. And there are many others like that. Very many. I just don't, don't want to get into them. So if you have translators and interpreters involved, the quality is going to rise. I think we should leave it at that. Either you want it or you don't want it. But my point is, and I really don't want to harp on this anymore, we, on the International Translation Day 2020, Cameroonian interpreters and translators under APTIC were extending a hand of fellowship to government and by extension to the Bilingualism Commission, use our services. We are part of this country. This is our domain. We want to help. And even to uh, the African Cup of Nations um local organizing committee? Fortunately, uh, they are using a number of translators and interpreters, and I'm very proud of that. I know a number of friends and colleagues who have been on the team of Kokan or Chan, and, and, and they, are, they are working, they are doing a good job there. I think that is a good thing. I, I salute that initiative, and it should go on. It should go on. It, that it is what should, 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 should That is what should be happening. That is what should be happening. That is positive. It's laudable, and I salute it. Okay. Um, on the 24th of December 2019, the head of state president, Paul Bia, signed a decree to um, enact the law on the promotion of national languages. Um, what is your appraisal of this particular law? I'm very sorry. I don't follow <laughs> Cameroon politics, Cameroon politics. So, so closely. And I... I, 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 I would not like to comment on something that I'm not very conversant with. But all this still has to do with bilingualism. All these things has to do with implementation. Yeah. Okay? Uh, we of have, course, that's the spirit of the decree. We already have enough laws yeah. and decrees by Ahijo and by President Paul Bia on this matter. So the issue is not the laws or the decrees. The issue is, are we implementing them? That is it. If we implement them, Cameroon will be the hub attracting foreign investments, attracting conferences in Yaoundé, Douala, Kribi, Chang, Limbe, and catering services. Do you know what the African Development we, Bank... Which means that uh, the language service, service sector can be a, a new angle in the tourism sector. We're talking about soft skills. I created a firm while I was at National Assembly, Competence. Okay? And I did a brochure on what Competence is offering professional translators and interpreters, and I described Cameroon as the haven of peace. Cameroon as Africa in miniature, the place to come to where you can mix business and pleasure. And I advertise our services and how competent we are, the fact that our passion has become our profession and so we are celebrating life, the fact that our competence has become a reference. Somebody in the Ministry of Tourism saw that brochure and said they were going to advertise it and use it as an official document to advertise Cameroon. That is to talk about how tourism is to be done. And the Minister of Tourism at, one, at that time was a young, young fellow, as tall as I am, I'm very tall, you know. 
But he was there for one and a half years, and his plan, he had a blueprint to revamp the tourism sector. But before he could now implement his blueprint, he was moved, he was sent out of government. So it was never done. So Cameroon, we can use uh, these skills. And you see, it is services which are running now. Products, not so much. What is Kigali offering? Kigali is functioning and growing because it has services. Soft skills. Soft skills. Translation and interpretation could do that very much for Cameroon. These services could sell. I was saying the African Development Bank. The amount of business, the catering services that benefit from the presence of the bank and the conferences that they hold, the number of workshops, the number of events or seminars and which need coffee break and lunch. And then you need the sightseeing events, art objects which are sold, all these pateo shirts yeah. and they sell them uh, African wear. It's making a lot of business in Cote d'Ivoire. We could have it here and better if we developed our translation services, interpretation services, and built up our tourism, and built, used our infrastructure, got our roads good. The road from Yaoundé to Douala, how many years after the road is still underway? I was watching the road, the ring road, yesterday. Yesterday. Before I got to the National Assembly, Dr. Solomon Shu and a number of others from the Northwest were talking about that ring road. I worked in the National Assembly for 20 years. I know MPs, PC, Fonso, and a number of others. They were talking about the ring road. I left the National Assembly 20 years after. It is now 10 years after that I left the National Assembly. That ring road is still being spoken about. It's not yet. It's not yet a ring. <laughs> that ring road is is still. No, no. You see. We, we, we really need to sit up. We really need to sit up. Is it sorcery? Is it witchcraft? Why can this road not be constructed? Why? 40 years? Next question. All right. You worked at the National Assembly um, for many years. Um, can you tell us um, what was your experience in the translation and interpretation department? of that uh, prestigious uh, structure? I walk back, I walk down memory lane with a sense of pride. But then the pride peters out at the end of the road. Madame Margaret Monjoa Campbell should take off her shoes and sit and you have the dictionaries, the lexicons, the glossaries around her. Christian English, supervising Winslow Sone, God bless his soul, Martin Chungong, Joseph Fossap, John Fombang, Honorine Sinde, Justine Ndongo Kele, Anne Bele, God bless her soul, Eugene Tawe, who is now at the ICC. We had an organized service and we worked hard day and night and we produced our documents worthy of the name. That was at the time. Many years down the lane, but I think um, the present Secretary General is working on their organigram, and I think he knows the house, and he's committed to putting translation and interpretation on the pedestal that it is supposed to be. Is that which explains why um, there were some workers of the house who completed um, a seminar on uh, bilingualism, how they can better ameliorate their language delivery? That must be part of the package. That must be part of the package. But you see, you must have somebody who understands what it is. Some translators and interpreters are respected because the people who are in charge, they know the, the, what they bring to the table. Others are neglected because they don't know what it is. So, but the National Assembly was a good training ground for me and for many of us. I just hope that uh, Mr. Gaston Kumba, who is the present Secretary General, a real fine gentleman, would uh, raise it higher and make it what it's supposed to be. Because how do you have legislation from citizens from English and French without enabling them to communicate? It's not going to work. We play a key role. Take it or leave it. We play a key role. Now, looking at the profession and the sector as a whole, how has COVID-19 affected it? And uh, what uh, changes uh, you, the professionals, making to live 
uh, with the pandemic? COVID-19 has ushered in huge change in the world. The world will never be the same again. Okay? We just need to face it. If you don't do the proper diagnosis, you cannot do a prognosis about what's going to happen. Presently, we are working using platforms. It's either Zoom or Interprefy or Kudos. So you sit wherever you are. I sat this morning at Onomo Hotel and I was covering a conference. I was interpreting for staff at the African Development Bank in Cote d'Ivoire. And some of them are in the country offices in Uganda, um, in many African countries. But we appear on Zoom and I'm hooked up as an interpreter. Another colleague is hooked up from Cote d'Ivoire. Another one is hooked up from Burkina Faso. And we work. So now the working conditions have changed radically. Now, if you are not conversant with the tools to enable you work, if you are not tech savvy, you are out of the market. You could start finding your way to your village because you are retired. Which means ICTs now is getting ground. No, there's sector. no way. The African development, they are working from home. It's only in November that we would see whether we would go back to the offices for two days or three days. But office space, parking space, and all of that, these things have changed. So tech savvy, internet, Wi-Fi connection, internet of speed, all of that, it is a new ball game. You need to master it if you want to stay in business. If you don't master it, you are out of business. I'm very sorry. You are out of business. That's how serious it is. If you can't pay your bills, it is bad. So that is the change it has brought. We, the issue is step up to the challenge, accept it, admit it, face it squarely, frontally, learn what you have to learn, change lanes if you need to change, but make sure that you can deliver. Make sure you are competent. Um, now, you worked at the um, International uh, Tribunal for Rwanda in Arusha, Tanzania. What was your most uh, challenging uh, mission during that time? I'll never forget when I went into the booth for the first time. Bembatum Francois was chief interpreter at the time. Good interpreter. And he gave us training for three months before we could go into the court. Because in the court, it was crucial. It was critical in the sense that a mistake could lead to the acquittal of a guilty person who has been indicted, or it could lead to the sentencing of a person who is not guilty. And so you needed to be very careful as you take interpretation from the witnesses from the Kenya Rwanda booth, it is interpreted into French, and then I take relay from the French into English, English. for the judge who's George Byron was from uh, the Bahamas or Kirks and Kaitos, one of those islands, Trinidad and Tobago, judges from Canada, from Senegal, from Cambodia. So you had all these three languages there, and you needed to make sure that interpretation was fluent, was fluent and was um, good. There was the interpretation of a person who was accused of genocide, and he was in a bar where this lady was frying uh, beignet. Yeah, okay. Call puff puff in kitchen. Puff puff, okay. And these are donuts, mm -hmm. if you want to... Yeah. Okay. And the interpreter into French says, Elle était en train de faire frire les beignets. And I said, she was frying and selling donuts. donuts. Now, this judge did not know or understand the word donuts. And so he said, yes, in English interpreter, wh what did you say? I said, she was frying donuts. He looked around and said, donuts? What is English interpreter? The court went silent. You could hear a pin drop. Everybody was expecting me to explain, explain. and interpret. But I couldn't. I, I didn't know what else to say because I've said it is donuts. It's fried. It is flour, flour balls. <laughs> okay? And then my, my colleague, Anne Bailey, unfortunately she died two years ago. She hit on the booth. Talk, talk, talk to Atsa. D, D. 
di mandazi mandazi now mandazi is the kiswahili word for donuts for or donuts. beignet so i said she was preparing and selling mandazi and then the judge judge Sekule, he said yes go on counsel my blood pressure drops like that because if you realize you are not they realize you are not delivering you're in trouble so it was very challenging but it was also very exciting and after that Whatever you go to and you say you interpreted at the tribunal, you have some respect and you have some acknowledgement, which is good. It was a wonderful experience. And what should Cameroonian courts do, particularly in relation to translation and interpretation? Because um, it's been a very, very uh, big problem here in Cameroon, talking about particularly the Seseko Ayoktabe case, uh, where um, the court had just one uh, translator. Do you think the court also, the Ministry of Justice in particular, has to pay more attention to the translation and interpretation uh, department for the smooth dispensation of justice? The simplest principle in justice is give everyone, everyone is entitled to a fair hearing. Mm -hmm. And you cannot have a fair hearing if a person cannot have access to communication or speak or be heard in his own language. Now, this Norman Cousins said, the most dangerous thing about ignorance is not ignorance per se, but ignorance of ignorance. If you don't know that, you do not know. No. That is what is sad. And many people don't know that they don't know. Besides not knowing that we don't know, that these accused persons must be given translators, interpreters, four, we work in shifts, 30 minutes, you shift, 30 minutes, because to keep your mind alert, mm -hmm. processing a language, the message and the language, the contents, you're running it through, running it through, running it through. You cannot do it for more than 30 minutes, one hour, and do it saliently and do it faithfully. That's why we work in teams and we have the shifts. So government has to recruit many translators and many interpreters to do that in the courts. Okay? If you do that, then they have a fair hearing. And then they may be sentenced, they may be acquitted. That is another issue. But if you don't even give them a fair hearing, you think that things are going to be solved soon? No. You antagonize the people, you radicalize them, it gets worse. Like in Romeo and Juliet, you had the feud between the Montagues and the Capulets. And Capulets. It only went on and on, and the damage was telling the, the pain excruciating and both parties all of us all communions will suffer from this thing the earlier it stops the better okay um, so my, so my, yeah. my two cents my two cents to make sense so that we can come out of the imbroglio in which we find ourselves is can we just be sober can we just be humble to say what is the problem let me hear you and hear you honestly the issue is you, you step on my toes and I shout in pain and you say, no, you are shouting out of tune. You should shout this way. You should not shout this way. And you punish me for shouting when you stepped on my toes and you want me to be happy. It's going to be very difficult. There was injustice somewhere down the road. Deliberately or not, there was some injustice that is causing pain. Now, if somebody is in pain, I tell you that I'm hungry. You say, no, you're not hungry. You are in my stomach. Can we be serious here? If I have a problem, listen to my problem. And then you, but don't tell me that I don't have a problem. Because you cannot determine whether I have a problem or not. Or not. So, um, I, I speak because I know too much to be indifferent. I care so much, I cannot be silent. But after I've made my statement and offered my services, there's nothing much I can do. Okay? So my two cents to make sense, let us be humble. Let us sit down and talk to each other. We are the stronger and the better if we are together. But if you make me feel that I don't belong, I will not beg you to stay here. I will be out of here. Okay. Um, on September 30, um, the International Day for Translation was celebrated. And it had as a theme, finding words for a world in crisis. How significant is that? The world is in crisis, health crisis, political crisis. Look at what is happening in America. 
Look at what we are, we are monitoring the situation in, in Cote d'Ivoire. Look at what's happening in Mali. Mali, Guinea. We are waiting for Burkina Faso. Guinea is bubbling. It is simmering. No, there are many crises. It's unfortunate. But we can deal with them. Communication. Talk to one another. If you talk to a person well, you start solving the problem. You start solving the problem. And if we don't even start solving the problem, forget about solving the problem. So words, which in other, in, in other words is language, which in other words is communication, which in other words is dialogue, which in, which in other words is interaction, is going to help the world to move forward. If we don't, we'll just lose feathers, we'll lose lives, we'll suffer, and we do not need that. We could do without it. Let it stop. Let it stop. Those are my two cents to make sense. If you take them, fine. If you don't take them, just what can I do? We are praying for this country. Because it's a beautiful country. Exactly. And that's why we have men like you who come here to edify the public. At Togo, it was a big pleasure having you on the program uh, today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Peter. And I must say that you're welcome uh, here any other time. Yes, I'll, I'll, I'll yeah, gladly I'll come to talk to, to, to young people. Yes. The old people, I wish them well. <laughs> uh, I, I'll gladly the talk to... Nice on the young. Yes, I, I want to talk to the young people. The future is ahead of them and they need to prepare to take care of my grandchildren. Exactly. The young people are my children and I want to make sure that my grandchildren are comfortable in this country. I travel a lot. I run into difficulties. I've been to over 60, 70 countries in the world. If I'm uncomfortable out of my country and I come home and I'm uncomfortable. Double punishment. You don't want it to happen to anybody. Thank you very much, Peter. All right. Thank you, too. And to you, uh, Televerias, it was a pleasure uh, being with you in this edition of the program. Thank you very much for watching. Programs continue on STV. Bye-bye.